Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay. I, uh, my name is Allison. I'm the moderator for Palma Strand. Um, she has been a teacher at Creighton for eight years, and she teaches um, various uh, at the law school at Creighton. And she teaches a variety of different classes, but um, she teaches alternative dispute resolution, conflict engagement and leadership, trust in a state, state and local governments, and a program called Street Law. Um, she also uh, works for the Werner in, uh, Center and teaches civic organization and, and democracy. Um, she has a book that she's co-authored. It's called Gaining on the Gap, Changing Hearts, Minds, and Practice. And then she's also the director of the 2040 Initiative, which is, I think, her baby. <laughs> she's very proud of it. Um, it's, uh, it's a conversation that's based on the research that says that in 2040, uh, there will be a demographic change to um, instead of having non-Hispanic whites be the majority, it'll be minorities being the majority. Um, and it's a, it's a forum where you can have conversations. Um, anybody can write for the 2040 initiative blog that she has. Um, she, you can just send your writing to her and she'll approve it and you can get it posted. But you can write about a variety of different aspects of race relationships. Um, so here is Palma Strand and her speech is called Racism 4.0. Thank you very much. And I see there are two clickers here. <laughs> Hopefully I've got the right clicker. Um, I'm Palma Strand. I'm in the law school, as Allison um, indicated. Thank you so much. And um, I'm here on behalf of the law school and the 2040 initiative, which I will talk about in, um, in just a minute. And um, as Allison said, let's try this. Try this one. And you all, you all can hear me? Yeah. Fine. Okay. Okay. The, the um, talk I'm going to give today is Racism 4.0, Implicit Bias, Institutional Racism, White Privilege, and White Advantage. And those are kind of the components of, uh, of what I'm going to talk about in terms of Racism 4.0. So why? Um, I just want to give you an introduction uh, other than the kind of the formal introduction that Allison gave us to who I am and why I do this work. So I um, am this middle-aged white lady, as you see. Um, I am married to an African-American man. I have three biracial children who are in their 20s. And so maybe 30 years ago, I started um, kind of entering into the world of what it was to be non-white in this country. Um, in a much more personal way than I had before. And as my children grew, I, uh, you know, we kind of shepherded them through school and I became aware of issues having to do with educational disparities um, in terms of outcomes by racial groups, particularly white kids versus um, African American and Latino kids. And the book that, um, that Allison referred to, Gaining on the Gap, was a book that I wrote with some folks in the Arlington Public Schools in Arlington, Virginia is where I lived before I came to Creighton, um, to really try to challenge those observed, acknowledged racial disparities in achievement in the Arlington Public Schools by addressing particularly issues of implicit bias and white privilege. Um, when I came to Omaha uh, and became a professor at the law school about eight years ago, um, one of the things that I carried with me was this, this strong passion for racial justice and kind of addressing the current manifestations of racism. And I, um, over time, I cooperated with a colleague in the law school and two colleagues in the College of Arts and Sciences, Sue Crawford in uh, political science and um, Rebecca Murray in sociology to start what we call the 2040 Initiative. And the 2040 Initiative, as Allison suggested, focuses on the fact that we are in the middle of a huge demographic shift in this country and that by the year 2040, the U.S. Census Bureau predicts that this country will be majority my own minority, which is to say that non-Hispanic whites, like me, will be in the minority demographically, ethnically, and racially. And what that means is, for me, that we have a, a kind of a window of opportunity here over the next generation to um, think about some of these racial and ethnic disparities that we are experiencing in all kinds of different areas, not just education, and to really think kind of uh, 
ahead of the curve in terms of uh, if we as a country don't figure out how to address some of these disparities, we're really setting ourselves up to not be as successful as a nation as we can be in the year 2040 and beyond. So that's kind of what motivates me both on a personal level and on a, a kind of a, a more, uh, more global scale. So that's the why of, uh, of why I do this work. So I'll give you a little historical kind of background because the way I see it, this is a very long arc. And there's a guy named Brian C Brian Stevenson, who's a law professor at uh, NYU, who um, is also the founder of an organization called the Equal Justice Initiative. And he actually has this, uh, the same long view, and he describes four episodes of, or kind of manifestations of racism in this country historically. Um, and the first one was slavery. That was back in the pre-Civil War days. Um, and, you know, we all know what, what slavery is. That was manifestation number one. We addressed racism 1.0. We addressed slavery as a nation with the Civil War. And after the Civil War, we abolished slavery with the 13th Amendment. And we engaged in what was called Reconstruction. We reconstructed the South. And there were civil rights laws. The first civil rights laws were passed in the late 1860s. Uh, and we also passed the 14th and 15th Amendments guaranteeing the equal protection of the laws and the right to vote. Well, and this is a picture of actually um, the, first, uh, the first colored senator and representatives who were elected post-Civil War from the southern, uh, southern states. And if you look at the fine print, you can see that people were, men were elected before the uh, women were given the vote, um, were elected from states like Florida, Alabama, South Carolina, so there was representation in the South. Post-Reconstruction, or at the end of Reconstruction, <coughs> started to fade in. There was white resistance to black empowerment and black enfranchisement, and a, what, what Stevenson calls a reign of terror, domestic terror, emerged in the United States. Um, lynching uh, was a was kind of the tip of the iceberg, and lynching was used as a uh, mode of controlling and um, obviously suppressing uh, black power in a variety of ways: economic power, social power, political power, um, and. Uh, it was kind of prevalent from the late 1800s, 1882 or something like that, to 1920. Um, you all may be familiar with the fact that in 1919 there was a terrible lynching here in Omaha. Um, but actually, just interesting point, a very young Henry Fonda witness, um, which turned, it turned him into a passionate advocate for uh, ra racial justice in the rest of his life. One of the things that the uh, kind of the domestic reign of terror, as we can think about it, against black people resulted in was the Great Migration. Uh, many, many African Americans from the South said, we don't really want to be here anymore, and moved. So people from kind of the eastern seaboard, the Carolinas and Florida, generally went north to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York. People from kind of Mississippi, Alabama came up the middle of the country to places like Omaha and Chicago, Milwaukee. People from like Louisiana and Texas tended to go west out towards Los Angeles and uh, the Bay Area, the West Coast. But uh, millions of people, millions of African American people who felt that they could have a better life in the country, in a sense, didn't emigrate, they migrated. And consequently, we had the Great Migration, which for the very first time brought significant populations of African Americans to our northern and western states and cities. Racism 3.0, probably uh, familiar to the um, group, Jim Crow, the sort of classic separation, separate but equal in rhetoric, separate but unequal in reality. Um, 
segregation and discrimination by law, which uh, kind of started to be enacted in the South starting in the late 1800s at the same time that the, uh, the kind of the lynching uh, period occurred um, and was embedded in Southern law um, until the mid, uh, the mid 1900s. Um, what I think is not quite as well known is that there was also a kind of a, uh, an echo of segregation and discrimination by law in the North, in the cities, uh, in the form of redlining. And redlining was a process, uh, or a, um, uh, a law actually, that was enacted by the federal government that basically <coughs> segregated neighborhoods in, um, in, uh, in cities by virtue of um, mortgage policies. And so if you were white, you could get a mortgage, uh, a mortgage on good terms to live in an all-white neighborhood. If you were African-American or you were white and you wanted to live in an integrated neighborhood, you were dis you know, those mortgages were disapproved. And so consequently, we had uh, these redlining. This is San Francisco. I pulled up San Francisco just you know, because it's not a southern city. And you see the red areas were, uh, were the, the um, disfavored, um, non-white areas um, all the way up to, I think the green ones, the blue or the green ones were, um, were the, the preferred um, and got preferential treatment, better rates, et cetera, for whites who could buy in those areas. Um, as we all know, the civil rights movement um, of the uh, mostly of the 1950s and 1960s, was uh, the force in American politics that led to the overturning of um, segregation and discrimination uh, by law, overt discrimination by law. Um, Martin Luther King, uh, whose birthday we honored just a couple weeks ago, Thurgood Marshall, young Thurgood Marshall, who argued many of the landmark cases uh, against segregation on behalf of the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund, including Brown versus Board of Education. Ella Baker, who fewer people know about, but who was uh, one of the predominant organizers in the civil rights movement and was involved in many of the actions of the civil rights movement, the Montgomery bus boycott, <laughs> Uh, the uh, sit-ins, uh, and then later the voter registration drives in Mississippi um, that kind of raised the issue of voting to a national scale. And then finally, President Johnson, who uh, really pushed through the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act uh, after the assassination of President Kennedy. The Civil Rights Act passed in 1964 and outlawed discrimination in public accommodations, including employment. The Voting Rights Act, which was passed in 1965 and outlawed discrimination in voting. And then the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which um, prohibited discrimination in housing. Relatively recent, from the perspective of somebody who was born in the 1950s, all of these happened within uh, my lifetime. So, in a sense, you know, kind of in the long arc of history, really not that long ago. Which brings us to today. And today we see um, what I have called race 4.0, racism 4.0, just because, as Stevenson said, race and racism kind of take on new forms. You know, it's like we try to eradicate it and it springs back from the root, but it springs back in a slightly different manifestation. And so our, I think our task today is to really look at what racism looks like today, try to unpack it a little bit, see what its characteristics are, and that will maybe, hopefully, give us the tools to figure out what kind of institutional and legal structures we can use to challenge it today, just as the NAACP and prior generations sort of sought to um, challenge racism in, their, in its previous guide, guise um, uh, in the past. So what am I talking about here? So implicit bias, I'm just going to go through these point by point and then kind of uh, 
try to pull them together. So implicit bias is the idea that you, all of us, could harbor racist thoughts without really being aware of it. And I'm just going to run through a little bit in depth because this is a, um, something that if you're not familiar with the concept, it's, it's a little bit um, kind of to get, to get used to. So what is implicit bias? Implicit bias, this is from the Kirwan Institute, um, which is uh, affiliated with, I think it's Ohio State, that does a very, very good um, kind of summary of implicit bias and the status of implicit bias. Um, did one in 2013 and one in 2014. Implicit or unconscious bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. Much of the literature suggests that these biases are activated unconsciously, involuntarily, and or without one's awareness or intentional control. That is to say, one of the, way, one of the ways that I like to think about this is that we have tapes going in our heads all the time. Again, I'm a little dated, so I don't think we have tapes anymore. Think of them as CDs going in our heads. We have, we have tapes going in our heads that tell us things that we're not even consciously aware of. And, um, and we act on those tapes. You know, when we see something or we see someone, all of our little tapes about what it means to be white, what it means to be black, what it means to be female, what it means to be male, what it means to be all kinds of things, just pop right into our heads without us being aware of them. I, I, I think of this as brain shortcuts, and I, I like to, our, our reptilian friend, that this is something that happens not at the cognitive level, but at the sort of instinctive level. Some of these brain shortcuts are really good, right? We get into habits that are really good for us, like brushing our teeth. You know, every night you think, oh, I'm going to go to bed, now I'll brush my teeth. Don't really think about it. It's a brain shortcut. You just kind of do it. Habits are very much brain shortcuts, which shows that they can be intentionally created. Here's another one. Go ahead and read this. Brain shortcuts. Right? We have lots of them. Some of them are really good. It's like, wow, we can unscramble something like this. We can find the meaning in it because our brains know where to go. Brain shortcuts sometimes lead us places. Croak, poke, joke, soap, broke. What is the white part of an egg? What do you want to say? Yolk. Yolk. You want to say yolk. What is the white part of an egg? The white. <laughs> Here's another one. This is actually my favorite stereotype um, picture. I don't know if you can read it. It says Donut Land. Right? Everybody laughs because we have in our head these these images, right? We we know that they're there, and when when something strikes them, we feel it. So a bunch of researchers, a bunch of psychologists from Harvard uh, and other places, the University of Washington and somewhere else, developed what they called the implicit association test. The implicit association test. And if you're interested, you can actually go online, type in Project Implicit, and take this test online. This is what it is. Basically, a reaction time test. What you do is you have to associate, that's the association part of the association test, you have to associate the words and images, which we know because we're so conditioned, we can tell whether they're European American or African American, and you have to associate them with good or bad. And what people have, the researchers have found over time, over about 700,000 respondents, 700,000 respondents, is that this is the way Americans respond to the implicit association. That these people associate Africa, African Americans with bad and European Americans with good. And these people are the reverse. They associate European Americans with bad 
and African Americans. That's good. And this is true even of people who are African American. Just because you're African American doesn't mean that you're not socialized the same way as sort of the dominant culture and the dominant norms. So there's a lot of people in this country who have these tapes, these kind of racist tapes playing in our heads, even though we are intentionally and explicitly anti-racism. Still, it might be a little bit of cognitive dissonance, but it's still going on. Okay, institutional racism. Institutional racism are <coughs> patterns of disparate outcomes created by collective action of institutions, culture, and social structures. These are some examples of disparate outcomes by race. School to prison pipeline, incarceration rates, achievement gaps, that's where I got into this work, voter suppression, unemployment, the list goes on. I'm just going to highlight a couple of these. Um, K-12 educational disparities. This is uh, a little bit of a dated um, uh, graph, although the current data is about the same, but there's just a gap in achievement between whites and blacks uh, in terms of students at all grade levels. At the same time, we have something maybe called structural racism structural racism. And what we see that, that contributes to this institutional racism is that black students disproportionately do not attend low poverty schools and disproportionately attend high poverty schools in this country. And we know that there's a correlation between poverty and achievement as well as race and achievement. So what we have here is we have kind of a synergistic or antagonistic effect of a vicious cycle as it were. Here's another one, criminal justice disparities. This is the one that Brian Stevenson focuses on in terms of mass incarceration rates. You see that um, the incarceration rate for black men is uh, disproportionately high. Um, the uh, black population in this country is about 13% of the overall population. The black population percentage of our prisons is about 28%, so it's over twice as high. Uh, it goes even higher if you're talking about death row, it's like 42% or something like that. An example of structural racism has to do with, here's an example of this, this idea of privatized prisons, which we have really gone in big for in this country. The idea that there are people who make a profit might be predominantly people who own a lot of wealth. Um, white people are disproportionate owners of wealth in this country. Um, and it creates a demand for prisoners because people want to make a profit. Prisoners who are disproportionately African American and Hispanic. There's another one that is perhaps more relevant to the subject of this conference, medical disparities. Um, there are medical disparities by race kind of all through, you know, infant mortality, et cetera. But here's one that's just very basic. All men, all women, this is life expectancy. White men and white women are higher than the average. Black men <coughs> and black women are lower than the average. That's a disparity by race. <coughs> There's a structural racism aspect to this. The access to um, health insurance is... Uh, uh, percentage of the population, percentage uninsured. Hispanic, black. And we see that the percentage uninsured is about twice <coughs> as high as the percentage of the population. White privilege. White privilege is, in some ways, I think of it as the flip side of implicit bias. Implicit bias is about tapes that have to do with um, negatives, usually, with respect to African Americans and, and maybe more positives with respect to uh, European Americans or whites. White privilege is um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's probably the most difficult concept of what, what I'm talking about today to, uh, to kind of internalize. 
It has to do with the idea that if you're white in this country, you have a whole bunch of kind of unearned advantages and privileges from you know, walking into a store and people aren't following you to seeing people like you on the news to knowing that your kids are going to have um, role models in their you know, textbooks in school that are going to be about people who look like them. Um, and that in, in many ways, we are socialized to not be aware of this. So it's not just that we have these advantages, but it's that we're socialized to not even think about the fact that there are advantages. And in my, in my perspective, that lack of awareness is probably the pinnacle of white privilege. It's not the tangible aspects, it's the lack of awareness. This is a um, some definition of whiteness that I um, that I think is very powerful. As long as race is something only applied to non-white people, they we that is white people function as a human norm. You know that case, huh? um, other people are raced. We are just white. There is no more powerful position than that of being just human. The claim to power is the claim to speak for the commonality of humanity. Raced people can't do that. They can only speak for their race. But non-raced people can, for they do not represent the interests of a race. And so one of the things that whiteness does is it says whiteness is the norm, and therefore the norm becomes invisible. And so people who are not the norm are then separated and, in a sense, marginalized. Because if you tell a story and you're white, it becomes the story. If you tell a story and you're you know, black or Asian or whatever, that's the black story or the Asian story. You know, how we talk about great uh, black novelists or great women novelists. There's a sense that it's not the norm, that it's something other than the norm and consequently is, is marginalized. Kind of a socialized lack of awareness. Now, I would actually say that there are a lot of things um, that are starting to out this sense of whiteness or this phenomenon of whiteness. My, uh, my daughter, um, who is now a, a college graduate, when she, she did a thesis in college on the use of humor to kind of highlight this question of, um, of whiteness. And I, I said, but you're like the only person I know who the research for their thesis consisted of watching innumerable episodes of 30 Rock and um, <laughs> South Park. Um, but in fact, there, are, there is some very sophisticated, particularly humor going on that really kind of gets to this question of whiteness and what whiteness means. So, um, so it's just this, this question of lack of awareness, which is starting very much to turn to awareness. White advantage. I'll let you look at the look at the cartoon here for a second. White advantage is the idea that. White folks in this country have really benefited from a lot of um, government um, programs designed to enrich citizens and to improve the well-being of citizens. When we're focused on racism, a lot of times we focus on, again, the kind of the, the disadvantages of, that have been imposed on predominantly black people, but also on you know, other populations that have um, that have come to this country. What we haven't focused on so much is, is advantages that were available to white people that were not available to other people. So I'm going to give you just a couple of examples historically. Um, my great-grandfather um, homesteaded in Iowa, and consequently there was family land that was in our family, uh, has been for generations. Um, he was a white immigrant from Sweden and, you know, came over and got land in Iowa and wasn't that a great thing. 
Homesteading, by and large, was not available to our African American citizens, even post Civil War. Similarly, when Social Security was passed in the 1930s under the New Deal, um, part of the deal that was cut in order to get the support for the Southern Demo from the Southern Democrats was that domestic servants or domestic service, hmm, predominantly African American women, and um, farm labor. Again, a lot of African Americans in the South were farm laborers, were not included in Social Security. Um, I already mentioned uh, redlining, which was um, the availability of um, uh, mortgages to, again, more white people. Um, much middle class wealth in this country is still held in the form of our homes. Uh, well, if your home is worth more or you are more likely to have a home, you're more likely to have more family wealth than, uh, than not. Um, getting to wealth, uh, this, is, this is the median family wealth by race in this country. Median net worth, this is 2009, $265,000 for white families, 28,500 for black families. This is pre-recession. The ratio here is about 10 to 1. The post-recession ratio is about 20 to 1. 20 to 1. Black families were highly disproportionately affected by uh, the mortgage crisis and the sort of accompanying uh, effects. Wealth is hugely important because it means that families either have or do not have cushion in times of economic uh, hardship um, or a nest egg to, for example, send kids off to college. Education, here's another um, uh, example of white advantage and disadvantage. Um, whites are much more likely to complete high school and to um, get a bachelor's degree or higher than, uh, than African Americans. Um, there is very much of a wealth effect in this, uh, which is um, tied into that. Strategies for change. So, okay, you're thinking, what a bummer here. Um, but as I said, it's important to kind of pick apart what the, what the components of racism today are because once we pick them apart, we can kind of maybe start to think about how to challenge them. So just include here some strategies for change. Awareness. Awareness is a huge one. I don't know if you re recognize Dan Aykroyd from the movie Trading Places, where we have, what's his name, Lewis Winthorpe, um, who, you know, is, is a, to me in many ways the epitome of sort of white privilege. Um, and starts to realize that things, uh, that that's, that's a potentially very precarious situation and, and thinks about what the experiences of other people might be and the ways in which his prior experience might actually have uh, blinded him to, uh, to how privileged it was. Um, one of, the things, one of the things about implicit bias and the implicit bias research of that shows that implicit bias is, or that implicit associations, I should say, are malleable. They're malleable. Which means that once we kind of know that we have them, we can actually start to change them. We can kind of take over those capes in our head is the way I think about it. And by changing our personal experiences, by changing our perceptions, by really kind of engaging with people who are different by getting into different situations, we can actually start to change the way we associate and the way we interact with people because of those sort of tastes in our head. Communication. Communication is obviously a huge issue. We are extremely segregated in this country in all kinds of ways. We're segregated by residents. We're segregated uh, in terms of you know, where we go to church say that's the most segregated hour of the week, you know, Sunday morning. Um, there was research that came out recently about, you know, how many friends of a different race people have. It's very low, very low. 
we just don't talk across races. And when we do talk across races, we don't talk about things that have to do with race. One of the things that I have been just incredibly privileged by living in a cross-racial family is that I've been privy to so many different conversations about race across race, uh, not just with my family and with my children, but with my in-laws. Um, and and that, you know, that is a journey that I've been on that has um, just changed me, changed me forever. When we're talking about more structural things, we focus on investment. And I'm, I'm putting up here a term, interest convergence. Interest convergence is a um, term that was, I think it was coined by Derek Bell, kind of the late great uh, critical race theory theorist. The idea that uh, essentially, it's a little bit cynical, that white people are not going to support um, uh, rights or benefits for black people until or unless it is in their own interest as well, as well, unless the interests converge. But there is starting to be increasing research and data showing that our interests truly do converge in many truly fundamental ways. What this is, is this is a map of various metropolitan areas. This is done by a group uh, out of Oakland, but they've just done an analysis actually for Omaha under our Heartland 2050 planning that shows the increase in GDP for a particular region from closing gaps in racial disparity, okay, from racial equity. And what it shows is that, here's Omaha right here, that most metropolitan areas, the GDP for the metropolitan area as a whole, which is to say everybody, would increase by a significant percentage if there was racial equity. R these racial disparities are a <coughs> real drag on our economic well-being, not just our, uh, you know, kind of our sense of equity, but on our actual uh, well-being as a whole. Our interests are, are converging and people are starting to realize that our interests um, here's another strategy that um, uh, sort of gets floated from time to time. The United Nations has an international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights that um, basically stands for something like this. Everyone as a member of society has a right to social security and is entitled to realization through national effort and international cooperation to sort of develop themselves develop themselves. Uh, the United States has never signed on to this international covenant, uh, even though it's been around for several decades now. We have signed on to the uh, international covenant for civil and political rights. We're all big into civil and political rights, but we are not into economic, social, and cultural rights. Things like universal health care, things like um, universal child care, things like a quality education for every child. Um, things like adequate housing, things like, um, there's one other one I'm thinking of that I can't think of right at the moment, but you get the idea, okay? Um, one of the things that is a little bit tricky about the United States signing on to this is that these rights have traditionally been within the jurisdiction of the states rather than the federal government. And so for the federal government to sign on to an international treaty would require some kind of internal negotiation between the states and the federal government on a kind of a legal level in terms of who's responsible, kind of a state's rights problem. Other changes uh, to be determined. I include this here because um, because one of the things that happens when people start communicating and becoming aware is that new structures, new institutions, new legal forms emerge that we really couldn't even have anticipated. And I think in many ways that's what we need to be focusing on. Is if we have these conversations, if we say these, are, uh, these disparities are um, unacceptable, 
uh, we will start to address them. We will start to develop mechanisms for addressing them. And this is one of my favorite quotes, and I think it captures, um, it captures our situation today. This is a quote from a historian who, uh, talking actually with Ben, a tribute to Ella Baker, uh, who I talked about earlier. Because this country has changed, we must change too if we are going to carry on the struggle. You move into a struggle with certain kinds of visions and ideas and hopes. You transform the situation. And then you can no longer go on with the same kinds of visions because you have created a new situation yourselves. And I think that's where we are today. And that's what we need to do. So questions? I'd be happy to take any questions or engage in discussion. Yeah. Uh, well, first, just thank you for coming and speaking. Mm -hmm. This is a really good point. Both of you have different angles to come kind of approaching this topic. Um, one thing that I've struggled with in thinking about, I guess, moving past um, like racism, trying to, I guess, move away from that, is balancing between othering and acknowledgement of, I guess, people who are not as privileged as, as white people in that case. And you hear people who say, oh, I'm hearing about like, gay rights all the time, like, why is this such a big deal? But at the same time, nobody's talking about it, and how do you make that acknowledged? How does that, what do you think is how a good methodology for striking that balance? You know, I mean, and I think this is in some ways the kind of the, the tension between the kind of the color blindness approach, um, we're talking about race, and, and the idea of um, uh, just talking about it. I guess my view is that, that uh, pretending something isn't there is not a very helpful approach if it is there. Um, and, I, and I also think, to be perfectly honest, I think that we don't want to be colorblind. At least I don't want to be colorblind. Because to be colorblind would be to say that all of the kind of rich tradition and history and story that is kind of black America is then becomes erased. Or, kind of, you know, kind of the flip side of that, all of the good things about white America then become not part of that. And I think the same thing is true with sort of um, men and women. I think that, you know, gay, lesbian, and straight. Um, to me, it's not an issue of sort of erasing the differences and pretending they're not there. It's a question of eliminating the power differential between the groups. And one of the ways, and I think the predominant way for me to eliminate the power differential is to acknowledge that everybody has a story, but that there is not a normed story. So that the white story or the male story is not the normal story, and then they've got, we've got those other stories, but that everybody has a story, and those stories are on a par with each other. But to me, that requires that they be told. It's a really good question. Yeah? Um, I'm wondering what your opinion on, or if you talk about affirmative action and sort of the process. I know a lot of places are talking about rid of it or have kids gotten rid of it and what do you think that will do? You know, well, I think, I think President Johnson, when he, um, you know, in the speech that he gave that where he was talking about affirmative action, about the race, you know, the, the race, not the race in terms of race, but the race in terms of like the foot race, where, you know, if people have started behind, um, we need to do something to make sure that they actually start at the same starting line. I think that that the affirmative action, as it was, as it has been constituted, is very much focused on um, individuals because our um, racism 3.0 was very much about individualized racism. I think what we're moving towards is we're moving much more towards thinking about uh, advantage and disadvantage as uh, structural and systemic and group oriented rather than individual. And to me that calls for affirmative action that is much more like public investment. It's more like investing in, um, in public education on a much more kind of broad-based and equitable scale than we have before. It's in investing in health coverage. And we see that there's actually a lot of institutional barriers to that. For example, the, um, we had a speaker over at the law school, Jamal Bowie, um, last semester, and one of the things that he's written about, he's a, um, a journalist who writes for Slate, is the, the 
um, correlation between uh, black populations and states that have not um, adopted Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. So that there's a lot of um, structural, I mean really systemic things. So we're not just talking about affirmative action like this person in Mississippi should have health insurance. We're talking about everybody who's poor in Mississippi should have health insurance. Similarly, there's some research, research that's been done on public education that, and this is where the 2040 initiative comes in, one of the things that's happening with our population is that older folks are increasingly predominantly white and our younger population is more heavily um, black and Latino, particularly Latino, which is the highest growing part of our population. Well, there's research being done that um, older white folks who get out and vote, vote down things like um, property taxes that support public schools because those kids are really not their kids. You know, they're not my kids. They don't look like me. Those are fundamental systemic questions that I think there needs to be affirmative action on. There needs to be that kind of public investment. We need to start thinking about it that way. It's not a personal thing. It's not an individual affirmative action. It's just very, very different. To me, that's where we need to go with affirmative action. Um, and actually, uh, uh, the Ta-Nehisi Coates article in the Atlantic, I don't know if you're familiar with it, where he talks about reparations. Yeah. That's actually a very good discussion that I think starts to get to this point. Yeah? What do you think about, you know, the last year that's been very important? About what? About Eric Arnold. Oh. I mean, I, I personally felt that that really just raised the question of age that they're so fundamentally important because the wealth gap and everything has become the norm again. Just like the 60s, some things were normal. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is the recognition was this isn't normal. You know, 20 times wealth gap is normal. Um, so I'm just wondering what. I mean, I think, I think, I think yes. I mean, I think actually, I had a student um, in a in a class this week talk about how the Occupy movement was kind of pointless because they didn't accomplish anything. And yet, I think that all of these things are sort of putting these issues on the map in a national way. And to me, it's, when you're talking about these kind of changes, we're talking about you know we're talking about a longer time frame. We're talking about decades. It took decades to get to abolition. It took decades to, you know, for things to work out in terms of, of anti-lynching. It took decades for the civil rights movement. I think that all of these uh, issues, you know, and when you see, like with respect to Michael Brown, when you see it on John Stewart, when you see it Hillary Clinton saying, you know, I as a white person need to be thinking about how it would feel. That, that conversation is starting to happen. I also think that we need to be having these conversations at the, at the intimate local level um, because that's where you really can talk to people, not just sort of having it modeled for us by national people. So like the, the dialogue that's happening here on campus tomorrow, I think that's a wonderful thing um, to provide people the opportunity to actually talk about these issues in a, in a way that feels maybe a little uncomfortable, but safe, because most people feel really kind of unsafe talking about this stuff. Yeah? Well, just to kind of fan talk with what you're saying, like, how do we have these conversations with people and, you know, you, with everything that's been happening, I know, like, from personal experience, um, you know, talking to people who, you're telling them, like, hey, what's happening right now is, like, modern lynching, and then they tell you, oh, no, it's not about race, and then they tell you, like, and then when you discuss about, you know, people, you know, something like affirmative action, they're like, oh, no, that's about race. It's like, well, how do I have these conversations with people who are white, who are not aware of these privileges, and to kind of just, you know, have, these, have them explicitly without, like, protecting white sensibilities, um, to kind of raise awareness and kind of start moving forward. Because right now, I feel like I'm very frustrated because I'm just kind of stuck in a rut trying to, like, wake people up. But I want to kind of see movement towards, towards justice and equality. Yeah. So, um, well, for one thing, I think white people talking to white people is one of the most important things that happens. Because I think that um, too often there is a kind of a collaborator mentality where a white person will say something and make assumptions about what another white person thinks. And if you as that other white person don't challenge what that white person has said, then you're reinforcing. But I've also found that 
found that you can challenge it without um, completely shutting the person down. Because another thing I've learned in sort of doing work on in this is that everybody starts where they are and everybody is on a journey. So you have to kind of start, even though it's not where you want them to be, you have to start where they are. And so I've found, I mean, like, here's a really simple example. I found that just asking questions is, um, for me, it's a better way than telling people. So, you know, what do you mean by that? You know, when somebody says, those people. So then, you know, what, what do you mean by that? I'm not really sure what you mean by that. And, and sometimes making those implicit assumptions or those, those code phrases, just kind of outing them, is, is a way to start both to signal that you don't necessarily agree with those that code that they're using. Like, hmm, either I don't get that code or I don't agree with that code. And potentially to start them thinking, oh, maybe, maybe. But I think the other thing is I think there are some people you're never going to change. There are some people you're never going to change. But just as with whoever mentioned same sex marriage, where we see the younger generation have a whole different set of norms and mores than the older generation. I think that there's this kind of paradox. I see the millennial generation as both not being very practiced in talking about race because, um, you know, there was this idea that we took care of that back in the 60s. Um, and yet also in some ways, just witness like my daughter's um, thesis, you know, watching shows where race is very much the topic of conversation. So I think that in some ways if we can bring that kind of to a more personal level, I think I think that there's a huge amount of promise in the current millennial generation, many of which you I think belong to that. Yes. Well it's it's frustrating to me. I grew up I was born and raised in St. Louis and my family all this stuff too. Um, but one of the frustrating things is the lack of people in like Ferguson feeling empowered to do something. They are the majority, but they don't walk about. It's very frustrating and it's frustrating for my family that are a mixed race and stuff. Mm -hmm. That how do we move people to feel empowered to so they feel they can take control back. Yeah. I mean I think those are the questions. Those are the questions. I am professed to have answers to all of those questions. But I think you know, if we start asking those questions as a, what is it systemically, what is it structurally that is, um, that is disempowering people from feeling, you know, that they, they can and should or, or, or take measures to exercise the power that they do have but haven't taken. I, mean, I think those questions are really, really important when we're talking about. And part of this, where we are now and how do we get there. But I think to the extent that we air those questions and have conversations about them, the answers start to emerge. We can't figure out what the answers are until we really grapple with the questions. I think we could probably take one more question if anyone else has any, but you also have um, like review sheets for her evaluation sheets in your packets. If you want to fill those out for us real quickly, that would be great. Does anyone else have a question? Thank right. you very much.